it is with the second half of Daniel that we can see the apocalyptic nature of the book. Chapter 7 begins with a dream by Daniel. Up to this point, he has been interpreting other people's dreams. But here, he has a dream of four great beasts, a lion with wings of an eagle, a bear with ribs between its teeth, a leopard with four wings and four heads, a beast with iron teeth and ten horns. Among those ten horns, a small horn springs up. It has eyes of a human being and speaks boastfully. The Ancient of Days appears and the beast is destroyed. One like a son of man appears and is given everlasting rule. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. By the way, take a look at the beginning of uh, the book of Revelation here. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like a son of man coming with clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And then later in the chapter, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Note the highly symbolic, puzzling language in this. There is reference to an Ancient of Days, but that Ancient of Days we can assume is God, but it, he is not named. There is the horn. The horn represents someone, but we are not clear whom. We are aware of all of these fantastic beasts, but not exactly to whom they refer. Its body is destroyed and given to the burning flame. What is clear is the fact that these beasts will be defeated, that all kingdoms come under the rule of God, and that God's coming kingdom is a reality, and that it will be an everlasting kingdom. So we have the themes of God's ultimate rule over everything. We will look at more of the figure of the Son of Man in a subsequent lecture. There are a few things, a few questions that have been raised. For example, we see that son you, that a term used of Jesus in the New Testament, but it is also possible that the Son of Man figure meant something sort of nearer to home and nearer in time during the time in which it was written. And this has been puzzled over people wonder who that figure would be within a time frame closer to the actual writing of the book. As we've seen, God controls all destinies here. The Gentile kingdoms are no longer potential servants as they might have been in chapters 1 through 6 where some of the kings are seen as acknowledging the rule of God. Rather, 
These are rebellious monsters. The interpreter is an angel. That's part of the apocalyptic genre. Gentile rule is overcome by the Ancient of Days, a cryptic reference to God. And then the question, who is the Son of Man meant to represent in its own time period? Later, we see that in the New Testament, it does come to represent Jesus. But who would the Jews of the time have thought it represented? Does it represent all Israel? Does it represent a Messiah? An angelic figure, as in Daniel 10 through 12? Does he represent the Jewish defeat of Antiochus Epiphanes IV? Is Antiochus Epiphanes IV the little horn here that is mentioned? These are some of the questions and connections that have been made by commentators. And coming to more of Antiochus Epiphanes, we see in chapter 9, 70 weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. This could be a uh, a reference to the exile here, the 70 weeks. Know therefore and understand from the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, this would have been in the times, say, of Ezra, Nehemiah, and some of the prophets, Haggai, for example, until the time of an anointed prince, there shall be seven weeks, and for 62 weeks it shall be built again with streets and moat, but in a troubled time. After the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing, and the troops of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who does that refer to? Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. This is all very cryptic language, which is very typical of apocalyptic. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall make sacrifice and offering cease. And in their place shall be an abomination that desolates until the decreed end is poured out upon the desolator. Now to put this in a possible historical context, Alexander the Great, who came from ancient Macedonia, north of what was then Greece, arose, became king, and conquered vast swaths of territory between 336 BCE and 326 BCE, and this included Egypt and Persia. However, Alexander died in 323 when he was only 32, and at that point he had not named successor. He did have a son, but his son, Alexander IV, was born after his death. There were years of fighting between various generals and others who had served Alexander, but eventually the empire that Alexander had formed was split between the Ptolemaic Kingdom, Egypt, the Antigonid Kingdom, Macedonia, and the Seleucid Kingdom in Asia. Among all of this, part of the policy of Alexander and his successors was to, sp to spread Greek culture wherever they ruled. This is called Hellenization. In some of the battles, um, Judea, which at some points had been ruled by the Ptolemies in Egypt, now comes to be ruled by the Seleucids. And here, Antiochus III, one of the Seleucids, tried to force Hellenistic culture on the Jewish community. 
some of whom did adopt Hellenism. This strained relations between them and the Jews who did not accept Hellenism. And those relations were shattered when Antiochus Epiphanes IV adopted his father's policy of universal Hellenization, but he, he took it even farther. He tried to enforce the Greek culture on the whole Jewish population. He appointed Jason of the Jewish Oneid family to be the high priest. Jason was not of the correct line of the high priesthood in Jewish thought. Antiochus then used Jason's power as the high priest to build a gymnasium, a gymnasium, just outside the temple, strengthening Greek culture in the heart of the Jewish culture. And gymnasium just sounds sort of very, you know, sort of benign to us because we think of it as just a place to do exercises and play games. But in the Greek world, it involved uh, a lot of, uh, it involved being naked. And this was not acceptable to pious Jews. Antiochus, who found his gymnasium a success, decided to push harder against the Jewish religion and more or less do away with it. There was a short rebellion and that just made him even more determined. He defiled the holy temple, he vandalized it and erected an idol on the altar. And many people think that this is what is meant by the abomination of desolation. It's an altar an idol on the altar of Yahweh. Antiochus also outlawed certain practices such as circumcision and the Sabbath. And altars to Greek gods and idols were placed in every town and those who did not pray to them and convert from practicing Judaism were put to death. At some point after uh, Antiochus had instituted these rather these very harsh measures, a Jewish priest named Mattathias with his sons revolted by refusing to worship the Greek gods. And Mattathias' son Judas Maccabee then led an army of pious Jews and eventually defeated the Seleucid dynasty, at least locally. Um, after their victory, the Maccabees then cleansed the temple and went back to, to traditional Israelite worship. Now, the Seleucids, of course, were far more powerful uh, across a vast territory uh, than could be defeated by um, the uh, Maccabean army, but the, the larger... Uh, group of Seleucids decided that rather than try to carry out a prolonged war, they would make some um, kind of political arrangements where there was local control and they allowed then religious freedom and stopped trying to impose the Greek culture. The Jewish celebration of Hanukkah comes from the tradition that when the Jews rededicated the temple, they could only find enough oil, pure oil, uncontaminated oil, for the menorah, that's the seven-branched candlestick that is in the temple, for one day. But it miraculously lasted for eight days, and that is what Hanukkah celebrates. <music> 